Okay, that, that was the right one to press. Hello, everybody that's joined already. We're going to wait. Obviously, we have about six minutes before noon, but we're going to wait about three minutes after that. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Halley. I'm a member of Buckley's marketing and engineering team. I uh, appreciate your all, all of your time. Thank you all for joining. You know, it means a lot uh, for you to join today. Uh, we put a lot of work into these webinars and we're really um, glad that you find them helpful. If you'd like to take a look at all the other webinars we've done since the beginning of the pandemic, um, this is a service we've been providing uh, for a few months now. And if you'd like to take a look uh, at some of our previous webinars, you can find them on our YouTube channel, uh, Buckley Associates. Today we'll be talking about low mass radiant heating and cooling. So today with, with us, we have Darren Alexander. He's a professional engineer and his, uh, he's a vice president of operations at TWA. He grew up near New Brunswick, so pretty close to us, just across the border of Maine and Canada. Um, now he's based out of Alberta, Canada, and um, works uh, at um, TWA in Alberta. So uh, we're actually pretty familiar with TWA. We're just recently, um, We've just recently become the exclusive representative for TWA, uh, but they're actually they've actually been pri uh, partners with Price Industries for quite some time now. They're arguably the biggest radiant system manufacturer in North America, um, but it's not a new system but us because we've been working with them for quite some time. Um, all of their products are vetted to lab standards and prices. Lab standards are really state of the art. Um, with Price, they can do all sorts of CFD analysis and mock-ups in their testing facilities. So that leads to a lot of big project opportunities with us. So if you have any qu any questions for us regarding your selections, selections of these systems and your designs, uh, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to discuss um, their application. I think we'll be seeing TWA radiant panels quite a bit in the future with their um, uh, key integration to displacement systems. Um, displacement systems uh, are going to be a big part of our future with their indoor air quality benefits. So um, that said, if you have any questions as we proceed, please send it in the chat window. Uh, we will answer them um, during at the end of the webinar. If there's a lot of questions, we'll send an email um, with the chat log. So the topics discussed today, we're all uh, very familiar with them here at Buckley. Uh, if you'd like to discuss them with us, we'd be happy to, to help you out. Um, but without that said, thank you for your time. And Darren, thank you for joining us today. Take it away. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us. Uh, trusting everybody's uh, staying safe and uh, away from COVID and, and life is progressing as it, uh, as it should under these uh, unique times. Uh, any event, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, low mass radiant heating and cooling. There was a presentation that was attached to the invite that is uh, identical to what you'll see today. I'm presenting from my PowerPoint as opposed to from the uh, uh, the attachment, only in so much as, uh, or only for the reason in that uh, I have moved some of the content uh, relative to the product to the bottom of the presentation to ensure that in the interest of time, we capture the technical details on the engineering aspects. And so you'll see uh, a bit of a jump in the presentation order uh, so that that information is uh, is appended to the end. So I'll present from the PowerPoint presentation just to have that flow. All the content is the same, so the information is there. I've just shifted it uh, so that we can get through the material. <clears throat> Um, this is a, just a roadmap to keep us a little bit on track in terms of where we're, where we're heading. The radiant terminal units that are in the middle of that presentation, as shown here, that's been moved to the end. <clears throat> uh, we'll begin with just a few applications so that you can see the product in situ and how maybe it could be used. Here we see some radiant sails above the, uh, the lighting uh, and the occupants for uh, terminal cooling applications, uh, and they could be in heating as well. But uh, the functionality is such that uh, added to the space, this particular suite could have uh, its own thermostat 
and its own temperature control, which makes it very powerful in terms of uh, flexibility for uh, individual uh, occupant comfort control. Uh, Twa fabricate on the radiant side three different products. Uh, we make radiant panels, we make radiant ceilings and sails. Um, they're in a progressive order of uh, capacity, I would say, uh, where the uh, you may have conventionally seen radiant panels that are fabricated out of aluminum or steel drop into a, a T-bar grid. They can also be suspended or free hung in what we call a cloud. And then uh, as you move up in higher sensible capacities, we create a convective component and have more than just the sensible exchange or sorry, the radiant exchange uh, with the product uh, for slightly higher capacity. Uh, so they have a little more convection component to them. All of these devices have both radiant and convective uh, components to them. Radiant ceilings are about 50-50, 50% radiant, 50% convective where sales can reach as high as 70% convective and 30% radiant, uh, which is accounting for their higher capacity. Uh, this is an example of some radiant clouds that are placed in a, uh, in a, a learning institute, actually, it's like a science center. Uh, you can see that there's integrated uh, sprinkler heads into the uh, free hung clouds. These were hung by Division 23, um, so not necessarily a crossover in the trades between Division 9 and uh, Division 23. Uh, and had the distinct advantage of only needing to purchase the, the cooling elements that were required for the space, as opposed to purchasing an entire ceiling. <clears throat> so it's, become, it's becoming more and more popular as a, as a trend for particularly open ceiling concepts. Just another uh, shot of a similar uh, appearance so that you can see that the panels are integrated into the architecture here as well. So uh, custom shapes are not a problem and uh, uh, really just understanding the layout uh, helps to guide where the load needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, this is a uh, teaching facility where the panels are uh, in the movable positions uh, where the curtain tracks are and uh, to lower the cost of the installation for the capital cost, uh, conventional acoustic ceiling tiles were placed in uh, the grid uh, outside of uh, the immovable pieces um, <clears throat> just to manage the budget and the initial capital costs. Uh, very popular in the 60s in VA hospitals, although Radiant in the 60s struggled because of building envelopes and controls uh, not being up to today's standards. And so with tighter envelopes and tighter controls, uh, Radiant's making a resurgence, uh, absolutely. And in particular for managing their movement in the space and for comfort and acoustics. We'll get into that a bit later. Again, just a few different uh, shots of some images that show some different looks. Uh, on the left, uh, we see a wood grain veneer on what's called a torsion spring ceiling. So these panels uh, face load into a T-bar grid and don't show the grid and can be dressed up with uh, with this wood um, veneer. Uh, integrated services, again, with lights, sprinklers, uh, wireless access points, you can see uh, uh, exit signs and so on. All of that can be coordinated into the reflected ceiling plan. And on the bottom right, again, same strategy of a perforated aluminum panel uh, just to the right of the light fixture and uh, to the left with the conventional tiles placed in uh, the T-bar to manage the capital cost. And uh, <clears throat> here we have a, a theater. Uh, the entire ceiling is all black, so it may be difficult to see, but uh, the function was uh, to integrate the lights, uh, provide an acoustic component. I believe these, com these elements, these cooling elements, these radiant panels, uh, yielded an, a noise reducing criteria, an NRC equal to 0.9. Uh, so very uh, aggressive and uh, excellent for acoustics in these types of applications um, with a thicker insulation, obviously. <clears throat> um, quite a bit of press has been written on Cooper Union, which is in uh, New York. Uh, again, torsion spring, uh, radiant ceiling, the payback on this building versus the conventional technology it was considered was 2.6 years. And because of the high cost of electricity, it meant that uh, the uh, university is enjoying uh, large rebates uh, compared to their operating costs were they to follow a conventional path of uh, fan coils and DAV based on the uh, consultant's analysis uh, energy modeling. Uh, a library in Calgary here. Again, we see that uh, Radiant is gaining in popularity and uh, larger buildings uh, that are looking for uh, uh, an opportunity to provide a different experience in the space, both for comfort and for acoustics, uh, noise in the space, 
are, are gaining uh, popularity in uh, mainstream for more and more uh, types of buildings. Uh, integrated into a, a little bit of a meeting breakout room. This space in particular has the uh, panels laid into the T-bar grid. And the inset image on the right here just shows uh, some detail on how that uh, is coordinated between the reflected ceiling plan and the mechanical uh, consultants to describe the <clears throat> uh, method in which the panels are connected together. So it becomes a plug and play map for the installing contractor. Uh, you can see these shaded arrays representative of a drop circuit from the uh, distribution piping, uh, reverse returned uh, where possible, and the inset uh, seven uh, uh, in a red square is representative of a different valving package. And so uh, this particular installation had uh, changeover valves for uh, six-way valves that would allow it, uh, the ceiling to either go into uh, heating or cooling. And uh, based on the flow, uh, there was a, an array of different uh, valving options to be able to just drop onto the plans for a typical flow uh, scenario. And I uh, uh, thought it was interesting to uh, map it out in the space to show how both the plans and uh, the in situ uh, solution might appear. Uh, this is a, a timber, a mass timber project that we did in Vancouver. Uh, it has radiant sails nested into the spaces of the timber here. <clears throat> uh, it won a, uh, an ASHRAE uh, Engineering Award in 2017. I think it was Building of the Year. Uh, very interesting from the perspective of uh, shallow floor plate. Uh, the radiant cooling was uh, focused near the glazing uh, with mixed mode ventilation. So the operable windows allowed for a cross flow to enter the building and follow a pipe chase or a natural draft vent that went through the center stack of the building. And you can see the bellmouth inlets uh, at the top of the inset image on the right-hand side. Uh, they look like two uh, round uh, bellmouths to a fan, if you would. And those allowed for uh, natural ventilation to uh, exit the building for, through the cross flow on the floor plate uh, at the uh, mechanical shaft. And so there are times in the year where this building, because of its orientation, that also has a wind scoop directed in the uh, uh, predominant uh, direction of airflow. Uh, there are times in the year when this building requires no mechanical ventilation. Uh, the wind uh, scoops through the uh, vents and the hoods on the roof, power down through to the bottom of the, uh, uh, the uh, vent stack, and then distribute through the underfloor uh, air distribution that's configured here just through a set of dampers and whatnot. Uh, there is, of course, mechanical uh, refrigeration included for uh, uh, those times where dehumidification is needed. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, low mass ringing and heating and cooling. We'll just talk about uh, you know where they where they fit, where they suit, and uh, then we'll get into the particulars of uh, you know the elements that become important for uh, the engineering of each of the spaces. Low mass ringing, heating, and cooling is a is a system that's a decoupled ventilation system. So we're we're processing the ventilation air separately from the sensible loads in the space uh, as much as possible. And uh, from a best practices perspective, we see down below where we've done a bit of an accounting exercise on an office versus a classroom versus a lobby space. And, and the reason for that is that it's not meant to be a silver bullet and used in uh, every particular space because the job's gonna be a radiant job. Uh, typically the strategy is that we would look at the low calcs from the space and determine how much of the primary air that's needed to satisfy the load is um, the ventilation air versus the air that's needed to offset the latent load. And then once that's determined, uh, we would add the radiant panels uh, to create the sensible cooling capacity upwards of between 50 to 80% uh, of the ceiling typically uh, because of mechanical uh, equipment and sorry, lighting and whatnot are being needed to be installed in the ceiling as well. Uh, it, there are opportunities to go with higher coverage density than that, but Typically, what we'll see is somewhere between 30 to 80 percent coverage uh, as a uh, as a bounded range for the sensible portion of the radiant uh, ceiling or sails. And then, uh, if in the in sum, if the primary air for min vent and the primary air for latent control uh, added to the sensible cooling of the panels is inadequate to meet the overall sensible cooling load, 
uh, conceptually additional primary air would be added, recognizing that we'll still be below our one CFM per square foot or one and a half CFM per square foot, whatever happens to be the convention for say like an all air solution. <clears throat> Uh, or some other technology could be applied. And so cases where the, the limits may be reached are, uh, uh, let's say you're in a corridor and you have a high sensible load, but very little ventilation requirements. That might be a, a great fit for uh, an active beam, or it could be a good fit for a radiant panel where minimum primary air is needed, but we have this long exposure of, uh, say, a, an architectural ceiling that could manage some of the glazing loads. Where on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the primary air is so close to meeting the sensible load uh, in the room that uh, it, it doesn't make sense for the capital cost to install an expensive uh, decoupled ventilation system such as a, a gradient ceiling or a passive beam uh, such as a, a chilled sail. Um, our general rule of thumb is that uh, once the air side is uh, contributing 80% or more of the sensible cooling in the space, uh, being governed again by uh, the latent cooling or min vent, then uh, we would start to question as to whether or not the decoupled solution would work well in that space. Uh, not uh, ruling it out completely because there are opportunities uh, potentially for air side economization or air side uh, variable control where the air could be modulated back on low occupancy and uh, it'd still be a good fit, but that would be our general rule of thumb to determine whether or not a space was a was a sensible fit for a decoupled uh, solution. Um, <clears throat> when we compare uh, the air and cooling of low mass radiant cooling to high mass radiant cooling, we're talking about uh, uh, similar operating temperatures, but clearly the, uh, the response times are far different. Uh, a high mass uh, radiant cooling system could take uh, hours to days to manage, and the uh, sensible capacities are typically lower as a consequence of us being in direct contact with them. So uh, if we agreed that a sensible cooling application with a radiant ceiling maybe peaks out at uh, 30 or so BTUs per square foot, uh, a radiant chilled slab might be half of that, uh, meaning that more of the load would need to be picked up with uh, you know, the air side or, uh, or some other means. Uh, the technology has both a convective and a radiant component and as uh, discussed uh, previously, uh, that fluctuates between the panel type and as we migrate from a radiant chilled ceiling into a radiant chilled sail that evolution uh, was created to uh, achieve higher sensible cooling capacities with less uh, um, first cost i guess in terms of uh, uh, capital cost and the radiant sail can push the limits of uh, say 70 percent convective and 30 percent radiant um, and and be and it could be easily double the capacity so we've uh, there are some products for radiant sails that can achieve 60 plus BTUs per square foot versus a radiant chilled ceiling that will be in the ballpark of about 30 BTUs per square foot as the upper end. <clears throat> With decoupled ventilation systems, principally what we're saving in terms of operating costs is uh, fan energy. And so it's far more efficient to move uh, uh, heat from a space with chilled water, having 3,400 times the heat carrying capacity of air um, this example is just representative of the mechanical components that would be required for, uh, as fluids to extract heat from the space. On the left, we have our, our min vent or our primary air, sorry, more correctly, uh, with a seven inch uh, round duct and a half inch copper pipe. Uh, would transport the same amount of energy as an 18 by 18 inch duct in a conventional all air distribution system. <clears throat> so we have a, a high probability and a high uh, opportunity for reducing the uh, sheet metal requirements for the distribution of the primary air will be able to reduce the total primary, or sorry, the total air uh, circulated in the space. And uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, air side reductions of 30 to 50 percent. Uh, I think this 80 percent is a, a bit aggressive, and I don't think that that's real world, except for in uh, particular uh, spaces. And in this instance, it's bracketed obviously as offices, which have very low occupancy and uh, very modest uh, sensible cooling requirements, but uh, that can exist on a job as a whole, sorry, not as a whole, but as an individual space, it's unlikely that you'll see something like that on, on a full building footprint. Uh, more in the range of 30 to 50% is, uh, is anticipated. 
Uh, here we talk just about the fact that if you're doing a, uh, a larger building from scratch and you're building it up as a decoupled ventilation system because of the reduced requirements of the ventilation, um, the floor to ceiling height can be compressed and it's not uncommon to see uh, one additional floor of uh, rentable space or developable uh, space that can be developed uh, per 10 floors uh, because of the reduction in overall duct sizing. And so from the perspective of uh, capital cost and, and budgeting uh, on, a, on a higher, uh, sorry, on a larger building or a taller building, uh, they, the economies of scale can be brought to bear for some very interesting uh, cost savings. Uh, Twa was involved in a project here locally uh, on a 65 story tower and over the 30 stories with the decoupled ventilation solution. Um, the project was able to extract $30 million of steel and concrete from the project. So uh, not insignificant sums on, on high rise buildings. Uh, this graph is, uh, or sorry, this uh, sketch is just meant to show that fundamentally we're, the energy that's being saved is coming out of the fan and the motor energy. Um, there's a little bit of a quirk in this in that it talks about the load from lights and the author wasn't uh, clear in this particular uh, sketch to, to define it, but effectively uh, a co the conventional air system was assuming that the air would be recirculated back to the coil to be processed for uh, cooling, where the radiant uh, cooling and chill beams, which are both decoupled ventilation systems, are uh, using 100% outside air. So the load from lights that were in the plenum were assumed to be ejected from the building. <clears throat> Here's some of the uh, the energy savings that you can see are are not uncommon. Uh, here we're just reviewing quickly the some of the operating temperatures. We still have to have a primary loop in order to be able to dehumidify the outside air. The primary air that we provide to the space is our only means of managing the latent loads that are generated, and so that low temperature loop is required for our primary air handling unit in order to dehumidify the primary air to manage the latent loads in the space, in addition to providing our ASHRAE 62 compliant air volumes. And then our secondary loop to prevent condensation on the terminal surfaces of the chilled ceilings or the radiant sails is generally um, two degrees C or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the dew point of the space. And so you can see here that uh, this scenario uh, will very easily uh, afford an opportunity for an extend delta T on the chiller. And that becomes quite significant, particularly on district cooling type, district cooling applications, uh, universities, hospitals, et cetera. And that low delta T syndrome becomes a thing of the past with these decoupled ventilation uh, inventory on say a university campus or at a, a large facility because there's a high volume of water that's circulated throughout the floor plates uh, on the ceilings uh, through the radiant panels or sails that is scavenging the heat uh, and bringing it back to the uh, the chiller loop. And so that uh, delta T range then can be pinned and the chiller can enjoy a high um, uh, efficiency for all operating hours uh, because effectively through low energy design, we're uh, scavenging the heat from the space, adding it to the uh, secondary chill water loop and allowing the chiller to see as high of a delta T as is needed to maintain uh, stable chiller operation. So very interesting from that perspective and, and uh, from the operating cost perspective, uh, it's uh, low hanging fruit for the owner. Here again, we're looking at uh, some heating uh, operating temperatures again, uh, less critical for the air handling unit because the coil can be selected to uh, impart the heat that's required even at lower temperatures. Cooling is a little different story because we have to uh, reach the uh, dew point and condense the water out of the airstream. So uh, those temperatures simply have to be that low in order to uh, achieve that or use some prohibitively expensive operation like desiccant dehumidification and that's that's generally not done in commercial applications uh, sorry just to flip back again to the cooling discussion but uh, uh, desiccant dehumidification is generally not affordable in an hvac application for commercial institutions uh, uh, and institutional applications so passive desiccants uh, chilled water in the range of 42 to 45 as a starting point are uh, more commonly seen for these decoupled applications. And then for heating, um, this, this bounded range is quite, is quite open. Uh, importantly, at the lower operating temperatures, if you've committed to a radiant cooling application, uh, because of the surface area, lower delta T's, sorry, lower supply water temperatures can be provided to the panels to provide heating to the space 
uh, because of the extended surface area. If the panels are used only at the perimeter, we'll tend to see uh, a propensity for higher uh, supply water temperatures for the uh, smaller areas that are typically used at the perimeter for uh, skin loads only. Uh, the major difference between high mass and low mass uh, radiant exchange in the space is the response time. So high mass uh, embedded slabs or uh, thermally active buildings, the response times are very, very slow. Like I said, uh, uh, 10, 12 hours, 24 hours, it can be uh, extended periods of time. With radiant chilled ceilings and with, in this case, chilled sails, you can see that the response time in the space for thermal control is very quick. Uh, a rate of change uh, pushing 0 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. And so uh, warming, uh, sorry, morning warm-ups or cool-downs uh, can be recovered quickly in the space and are, are well within uh, the conventions that are, would be competing technologies or alternate technologies, I guess, if, you, if we were uh, looking at radiant versus an all-air solution for morning warm-up or cool-down cycles um, with this technology. Cool-down's a little slower uh, because of the approach temperatures, um, about 20%. Uh, slower and again this is a radiant chilled sail and so uh, there's a higher convective component to this in the space. Uh, acoustics with radiant is very low uh, if there's no air in the system which there shouldn't be uh, the venting of the uh, distributed water is important obviously and we'll talk about that when we get into the engineering side of things but uh, the panels can double in function for uh, acoustic attenuation in the space. Um, the large ceiling panels that we saw at the beginning that were free hung by uh, Division 23 uh, were perforated and equipped with insulation and yielded an NRC in the space in the neighborhood of 0 0.7. And uh, so the open concept benefited materially from the panels without having to double the costs on the budget for uh, acoustic treatment of the uh, void behind the panels uh, because the panels gave the function of both thermal control and uh, acoustic attenuation. So uh, that is important uh, in the discussions with the architects relative to budgeting, so that they understand that uh, you know the ceiling component is covered under the mechanical side. Uh, the acoustics are contributory by the panels themselves, which are needed for the thermal uh, performance of the panel in the space, and uh, can be quite interesting from the perspective of really um, managing uh, acoustics in a particular area. Uh, not true for sales, and uh, the project that uh, I also showed at the beginning that had the sales nested into the timber construction, uh, comments came back as well that uh, further measures were needed to manage that space because of the hard wooden surfaces and whatnot. And so it's important to realize that uh, the products are uh, suitable for many spaces, but uh, can present some challenges under some circumstances. And so understanding those circumstances allows us to address those issues with uh, other means. Uh, project specific testing is available so uh, through the testing facilities of our partners in Winnipeg at uh, the Price Research Centre North the uh, space can be mocked up. Uh, it can uh, simulate solar loading. Uh, the thermal, the calorimeter chamber can be used for uh, response uh, testing and the, uh, the suite of testing uh, capacities that exist at that facility can be used to uh, uh, resolve uh, questions that exist in a particular space for more challenging uh, scenarios. This is a bit of a, uh, a layout so that you can maybe see how the panels would be piped together and presented. They're easily zoned. Uh, in this particular instance, the three sail arrays that are on the right-hand side of the image are reverse returned. and so. Each of those arrays do not have uh, balancing valves. Uh, one could argue that uh, the last one with a slightly shorter panel could potentially require a balancing valve, but for argument's sake, and in this particular instance, it wasn't uh, considered to be materially or germane to the uh, water pressure drop of the three individual sail arrays. And so uh, the control valve was simply used to manage that entire array off of one thermal control valve. So they can be very affordable and very uh, miserly in terms of uh, managing large open areas uh, with some uh, a little more elegant uh, piping, so to speak, as opposed to high valve costs and, and so on. Uh, a big advantage of, of panels as well is that they're 
they're very low maintenance. There's no filters, there's no rotating elements in the space. Uh, they actually absorb noise, they don't make noise. Uh, there's no fans, uh, sorry, or compressors, sorry, or compressors. Um, the, uh, the life cycle of the panels are typically governed only by the uh, water treatment of the facility. So if the water treatment is, uh, is not maintained and the piping system in the building is deteriorating as a result of that, the panels will suffer as well. But if the, if the piping is uh, properly maintained with a water treatment plan, uh, the panel should last for the life of the piping system. And so uh, think in the neighborhood of 30 to 50 years easily uh, with a, uh, a rigorous or a conventional water treatment uh, uh, plan. Uh, the buildings that have currently um, radiant chilled ceilings are a part of an inventory that had been uh, cataloged by the Center for the Built Environment in California. And uh, these spaces that uh, are predominantly uh, uh, radiant uh, service, service with radiant, are seeing uh, a reduction in energy consumption in the neighborhood of about 30%, uh, give or take. Now that's not a surprise because these buildings are also have exceedingly uh, good envelopes and efficient equipment are used to uh, pair the uh, solution with the, uh, with the panels. So the panels themselves are just a tool in the consultant's toolbox as a solution for some spaces. It's not what uh, obviously drove these buildings to these uh, high efficiencies on their own, uh, but they were part of the, the contribution, they were a contribution to the solution. Uh, I talk about the limitations a little bit in the panels just so that it, people are aware that there are some missteps that can be had that uh, could conceivably or unbeknownst to uh, uh, the designer uh, add additional cost needlessly and so uh, piping can become a uh, uh, an issue um, <clears throat> envelope is always uh, worthwhile to invest in the envelope and uh, for radiant systems uh, a tight envelope is good for both the, the solar loads and the, the latent loads sorry both the solar uh, the sensible and the latent loads but uh, this pays dividends to the uh, operation of the facility for the life of the building so that's uh, uh, obviously uh, as, as good of envelope as you can argue for with the architect is uh, well paired with a decoupled ventilation system and chilled ceilings. Uh, again, talking about the budget with the architect to ensure that Div 9 doesn't double up on the budget. Uh, again, back to that uh, example where we had Division 23 installed the monolithic radiant clouds that were in the neighborhood of seven to nine feet wide and upwards of uh, 14 and 15 feet long. Um, that meant that that trade was not required for that portion of the space and in that particular instance it was uh, considered on both sides of the equation for the mechanical sorry for the budgeting of the facility and when they discovered it they were like oh yeah we, we missed that uh, anyways it uh, it can happen so just be aware of it um, there is limited air site economization with decoupled ventilation systems we're going to have small uh, CFM per square foot values far below what you may be accustomed to seeing in an all air solution uh, it's not uncommon to see spaces as low as 0 0.25 CFM per square foot uh, in lightly occupied spaces. I'm thinking like a single occupied office or whatnot. Uh, and upwards of uh, 0 0.75 to 0 0.85 CFM per square foot is uh, something that you might see in a, uh, a university application in a classroom. Um, and then beyond that, we, we question whether or not the a decoupling will be uh, advantageous. If that air side load fraction again is being driven by our obligations for managing latent load. <clears throat> uh, some very elegant uh, um, control strategies have existed. We've seen uh, heat recoveries chillers and uh, heat pumps used to as peaking chillers and for load shifting. So uh, in a case of a project here in town where uh, the building was base loaded with a chiller that was sized for about 60% of the, uh, oper the peak operating uh, needs. And then uh, water to water heat pumps were used for uh, peaking chillers and also were used for load shifting. So here in Edmonton, uh, we have a shoulder season that's quite lengthy. And uh, there are cases where we'll need heating on the north side of the building and cooling on the south side because of the solar loading. And so in this particular instance, the chillers were used to uh, provide higher temperature chilled water, the secondary chilled water temperatures in the neighborhood of 50 to uh, 55 to 62 ish entering um, on the south side and then the heater rejection from the water to water heat pumps were then piped to the 
or sorry, pumped to the north side of the building uh, to provide heating to the panels on that side. And so the base loaded chiller was running at peak efficiency for uh, the majority of the year. And these swing chillers allowed for optimization on um, where the uh, scavenged heat would be redirected within the space. <clears throat> it's uh, it's not untrue that with the decoupled ventilation systems, and particularly with radiant uh, solutions, we will see uh, larger distributed pumping system solutions. And, uh, that might include, uh, it's gonna include larger piping uh, for the distribution mains, as well as the runouts for the uh, individual zones. Um, but here's just a few things to uh, to manage on, on the list of uh, uh, check, the checklist, sorry, for uh, your design uh, review. Uh, and many times people will talk about uh, cooling and humidity control. Uh, humidity can be controlled in any building in, on the planet. Uh, more recently, uh, in collaboration with Price, uh, TWA supplied uh, radiant panels to ASHRAE's headquarters in Atlanta uh, through a generous uh, donation uh, of Price's uh, uh, contribution to ASHRAE. And so uh, TWA fabricated those and sent them down for the ASHRAE uh, headquarters. And uh, I'll provide a link for that just as a bit of a recap. If anybody's interested, I'll provide that through uh, the Buckley uh, facilities so that uh, you can see what was done there. Uh, but uh, humidity can be controlled. The envelope, the, uh, a tight envelope obviously is important, but uh, once the dew point in the space is managed, uh, these uh, equipment choices become available to us for uh, improving comfort and lowering operating costs. <clears throat> this is a recap of what we talked about previously in terms of the airside load fraction being less than about 0.8. And uh, yes, we've used them in spaces where the airside load fraction is higher than this, but uh, with uh, modulating uh, or terminal uh, air control, um, it was only ever operated as uh, suited to meet the space, inclusive of uh, it, accessories and controls in the space for uh, real-time feedback in terms of dew point control and whatnot. And we'll get into that as we get into the engineering part, which is up next. It's not uncommon to see radiant chilled ceilings coupled with active beams. Uh, the only caveat to their use together, and once you do go through the exercise of looking at each of the spaces for their earth-type load fraction for decoupled ventilation, the only real caveat is that uh, active beams Re, uh, allow for slightly lower secondary chilled water, which uh, yield a little bit higher capacity as a consequence. But because of the more stagnant or the more uh, gentle convective air flows across the radiant ceiling or, or a radiant sail, uh, the entering water temperatures for those systems uh, need to be about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the room dew point, uh, where uh, a chilled beam may only need one to two degrees Fahrenheit warmer. So just be mindful of that so that if uh, beams and panels are being coupled together uh, because they 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 pair well, uh, that the chilled water system is likely gonna be just a little bit warmer than it would be for uh, just an active beam solution that uh, benefits from the recirculated air across the coil and so allows for a depressed uh, chilled water temperature, entering chilled water temperature in comparison to the uh, radiant chilled ceiling. <clears throat> Here's the spaces where they are less interesting. Uh, obviously smaller buildings. You can imagine that as a uh, an applied system, we have an air handler, a chiller. Uh, we need to deal with uh, low eco air side economization, which means we may need a water side economizer. Um, and so they can be prohibitive uh, for smaller footprints. Uh, general rule of thumb is uh, for, for me in terms of just looking at the capital cost, some, nothing less than about 25,000 square feet. Now that being said, uh, we've done spaces that are smaller than 25,000 square feet, particularly on university campuses where the infrastructure is existing. There's already a chiller plant. They just have the uh, air handling unit that needs to be purchased, and it's reasonably inexpensive because of the small um, obligations of the uh, primary air. Uh, and so it's a general rule of thumb. It's not meant to be written in stone. It's uh, just a guideline. Uh, high latent loads are, uh, are obviously out uh, because of obvious reasons for managing that and retrofits with a poor envelope. And so retrofits are often interesting for radiant chilled ceilings because of the low requirement of uh, ceiling space. Uh, we've mounted panels in as little of surface ceiling space of uh, four to six inches. 
but uh, if the envelope needs uh, some remediation before that's considered, then that's fine. So again, not as hard and fast rules, but as a, uh, a reminder that uh, older envelopes may need a little bit of love in terms of treating the uh, the glazing and uh, the, en uh, the envelope for uh, leakage and latent control prior to it being considered. But very uh, commonly, panels can be used in historical applications as well, or historical buildings, sorry. <clears throat> We're pushing time, but uh, I talked a little bit about this stuff as we went through, so we'll uh, we'll continue on. In terms of the uh, general concepts for engineering, the rating panels uh, are sized for our sensible heating and cooling. Our air side is driven by our uh, first and foremost uh, ASHRAE 62 requirements for minimum ventilation uh, for our breathing air. Secondly, we'll look at the psychrometrics between the off-coil condition, so how dry that delivered air is, versus the, humid uh, the humidity that uh, we're allowing the space to reach. And since we know the latent load, we can very easily calculate the mass flow of air that's needed to offset that latent load uh, through a very simple calculation. And then again, through that accounting spreadsheet, uh, we can highlight which spaces are uh, well suited for decoupled ventilation and which spaces may need a little extra uh, uh, consideration. And then any additional air that might be required to top up the capacity in the event that we max out a ceiling coverage area. Um, and then uh, we talk about humidification and building static pressurization. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, and we look at the sensible cooling that's uh, contributed by the water, and we look at uh, you know what optimization can be included for the mechanical uh, equipment. Uh, rating cooling capacity is reasonably low cooling uh, terminal devices. Uh, this slide is a bit misleading in that it shows that 50% of the coverage will yield 12 to 15 BTUs per square foot. That's meant to represent on the floor plate 12 to 15 BTUs per square foot. The panels themselves will actually uh, typically see in the neighborhood of 20, 20 to 30 BTUs per square foot as the radiant chilled ceiling with radiant chilled sails offering uh, upwards of double this capacity because of its convective component. Um, it's true, they're not typically cost competitive for the complete load, but as is usual with decoupled ventilation systems, we'll always have that contribution of the primary air for ASHRAE 62 and latent control. Um, hybrid systems are very common as well to pair them together. Uh, they can be with active or passive beams, uh, fan coils, uh, overhead mixing, underfloor air displacement, or just uh, straight displacement. Uh, uh, the perimeter can be a challenge, uh, particularly self-facing glazings. So it's not uncommon to see active beams bathe the glazing for uh, radiant asymmetry control and high temperature perimeter heat gains with uh, the core being treated with radiant panels or sails uh, more conventionally for their lower requirement or obligation of primary air distribution. Uh, and again, our air sites providing the ventilation air, dehumidification, um, building pressurization, and any additional sensible cooling. And this is not uncommon where we'll see uh, primary air in excess of the air that's needed to manage the latent load. <clears throat> and the maximum of those uh, are what drive the uh, primary air into a given space. Um, so when the primary air of the supplier is greater than the ventilation air, we may have some recirculation. That's uh, often done, uh, recognizing that we still need the mass flow of primary air to offset the latent load in the space. So maybe it's not 100% outside air, uh, and that's okay. We just uh, fix, you might see a reversal on the uh, outside air ratio. So in a conventional air system, you might see 10 to 30% outside air in a recirculated airstream. In the decoupled ventilation system, we might see 70% outside air and 30% recirculated in that neighborhood. Uh, again, uh, not a hard and fast rule, just as a general rule of thumb. We'll also see 100% uh, outside air systems, and, and this was what was done, uh, I believe, at the ASHRAE facility. Um, so that's processing uh, Atlanta, Georgia air, 100% outside air, dehumidifying it and using it for uh, min vent and latent control. And as a matter of fact, I believe they over uh, supplied primary air uh, in keeping with some lines of thought of 30% excess air, uh, again, for IAQ and for uh, comfort in the space. Uh, may not be affordable to do in all spaces, but uh, in that particular area, I think I believe they did something like that. <clears throat> uh, 
energy recovery is not uncommon with 100% outside air. And uh, it's, it's more um, well suited, I guess, for dry climates. And so these are some of the consequences of our, our decisions in terms of our primary air temperatures and uh, uh, what we design into the space for uh, permissible relative humidities. And so for these conditions, we're going to look at a 75 degree Fahrenheit dry bulb in the space with a 50 to 55 percent relative humidity dew point, sorry, 50 to 55 percent relative humidity set point in the room. And uh, as we lower the room relative humidity, we'll find that the primary air volume will increase because we have less mass flow of primary year to offset the latent loads so we're going to need bigger fans uh, if we increase the uh, relative humidity design uh, limit uh, we'll decrease the primary air volume and we'll yield smaller distribution fans uh, lowering the primary air dew point temperature lowers the primary air volume but can increase energy uh, because of smaller fans lower chiller uh, efficiencies uh, higher coil pressure drops and possibly reheat and then higher uh, primary air temperature obviously increases the primary air volume but can decrease energy and here's the summation of how that can be done uh, and so we're looking for the, the Goldilocks zone and uh, so I graphed that here to show um, an estimate of the primary airflow per person uh, to control the latent load versus the room control dew point at various primary air dew points so this is a uh, these uh, family of curves that are moving towards the right and as we uh, progress left on the axis there's an energy consequence to uh, lowering the primary off coil dew point and in this particular case we've uh, marked the line at about 17 cfm give or take uh, recognizing that, that value as being approximately min vent and uh, as we look at the bounded conditions of uh, 50 to 55 to 60 percent relative humidity up the right side of the page here we can see this range of uh, increase in mass flow required to achieve those uh, criteria and can find that you know you can push double almost double the requirement of airflow in the space versus the base load of min vent by looking at very low dry air something more conventional at like a 72 degree Fahrenheit 50% relative humidity or a 75 degree Fahrenheit 50% relative humidity and you might preclude this as even being an option uh, in your space because of that and uh, I would challenge you to consider uh, exploring um, a room relative humidity slightly higher than this and there's an article that was published in the ASHRAE journal and I think it was 2017 no sorry 12 or 15 um, that uh, discusses this uh, in terms of just uh, optimizing your mass flow of primary air for uh, latent control and contingency as well as uh, uh, fan energy uh, lowering the primary air volume, the primary air temperature by two degrees Fahrenheit will decrease the primary air mass flow by 25%, uh, which is significant, uh, or it's not insignificant. Um, and we find that as we follow through that exercise, that through this bounded range of uh, operating temperatures, we can encapsulate this space that is uh, somewhat an optimization of capital cost equipment availability without using exotic equipment such as desing and dehumidification uh, etc and uh, can see that uh, a 75 degree 55 percent relative humidity is not a bad starting point uh, in terms of checking all the boxes for capital cost uh, efficiency and uh, required mass flow to meet and invent as well as uh, latent loads uh, right here so primary air dew point between 50 and 52 uh, for these particular conditions and, and in your climate it may be slightly different so I would uh, encourage each of you to look at uh, your own uh, energy requirements for your uh, climactic zone and uh, run through a similar exercise determining the uh, optimal off-coil air temperatures for your primary air paired to the obligations of mass flow into the space to offset your latent loads Um, as we move into higher capacity equipment from radiant panels to radiant sails, and the radiant sails are creating these convective currents that are churning the space, these units are, are less uh, applicable to uh, stratified airstreams in the space. 
you'll see these uh, more as partially stratified or even fully mixed in the uh, in the room when you're looking at radiant sales. So the uh, the cost of the higher efficiency of a radiant sale is that uh, you'll uh, lose your ability to stratify the airstream. And so radiant uh, panels themselves tend to uh, be restricted to uh, uh, the, sorry, the uh, uh, stratified airstreams. Um, I talked about this a little bit before. Again, the entering chilled water to a radiant panel or sail is generally about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than a room dew point. And uh, with a room dew, sort of with a room temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 55% relative humidity, we'll see a typical room dew point of about 58. So the chilled water supply temperature into a radiant chilled sail or uh, a chilled ceiling will look something like 62 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to prevent condensation on those surfaces. Uh, too close uh, and we get uh, a risk of condensation and obviously we'll have controls in the space for uh, real-time feedback uh, to be able to either, uh, particularly on spaces where we maybe are managing the air side uh, for uh, the occupants, if the, if the load varies heavily, I'm thinking like a meeting room or a classroom, uh, say like a university space as well. Um, and there's some strategies for managing the air side uh, supply to the space paired with the radiant panels or sails for uh, an elegant handover, handoff from air side to uh, sails or to allow or permit the radiant sails from radiant panels from being activated. Uh, chilled water temperature rise is something that you may or may not uh, expect, but the, the water temperature rise of a chilled ceiling is uh, typically no more than six degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason for that is that the um, higher the delta T on the chilled water side in the secondary loop, uh, the lower the tube velocity. And as we approach six degrees and exceed six degrees, we find that the Reynolds number for the water flow in the tube begins to decay very quickly. And so we get into a Reynolds transitional zone and then into full laminar zone above a delta T of about six degrees Fahrenheit for the tube diameter that we're talking about. And so uh, more conventionally, we'll target five to six degrees as a delta T for our zone. And uh, for spaces that are smaller where we just can't get the heat into the panel, uh, quick enough, you might see delta T's as low as two, um, but overall, we, the system would be designed in the neighborhood of five to six degrees. Recognize that for every degree uh, below six degrees that the system is designed, uh, the water flow rates will go up, and so it will require bigger piping, etc. So be mindful of that. Uh, pressure drops for the fields are generally restricted to about 10 feet, but uh, depending on what uh, you as a consultant have decided uh, the terminal pressure drop should be, there are innovative solutions for both piping the, the panel and manifolding them to uh, to lower the pressure drop in the zone. Uh, we talked about the heating water temperatures again. Uh, lower hot water temperatures are really only applicable to spaces where radiant cooling is the, uh, the dominant surface in the space, and then those surfaces are being converted to heating. Uh, low temperature water at the perimeter is harder to yield good uh, BTUs per linear foot at the, for the skin losses. And so conventionally, we'll see thinner panels at the perimeter with higher temperatures, and that's that's quite common. Uh, hot water temperatures as high as a delta T at 20 degrees. Um, as a general rule of thumb, chilled water circuits will see at least one US GPM. And as a general rule of thumb, we like to size the heating circuits for no less than 0 0.5 US GPM, although with high temperature uh, systems, they can be lower than that, as low as 0.3. And, uh, with chilled water systems, uh, a general rule of thumb is to stick with at least one US GPM per circuit. Uh, here's the graph that describes the uh, the drop off or the decay in capacity as we uh, move into the transitional and the laminar zone of flow by increasing the delta T on the chilled water side. Um, and, and higher water flows uh, can be problematic in terms of noise. So watch your pressure differentials on your distributed water and your uh, max water flows on your branch circuits. Uh, I would say for GPM, U US GPM would be uh, on the upper side of uh, what would be typical for a radiant chilled circuit, uh, be it a chilled ceiling or a chilled sail, three and a half to four at the most. Uh, and again, we talked about the lower limits. Um, we also talked about the piping and how piping them in uh, reverse return can help to uh, uh, limit costs and uh, reduce the need for balancing valves and whatnot. Um, 
and I'll just leave it at that, I guess. <clears throat> the applied cooling capacity, again, is the, is the approach temperature between the room and the mean water temperature. So the occupants and the, uh, the mass in the space of, the, uh, of everything that's in the room is what uh, the panel see. And then until that reaches steady state, uh, energy will be absorbed or emitted to those surfaces. The panels are a, light, uh, sorry, a line of sight product. Uh, and so if, uh, if you can see it, obviously the energy decays as you uh, are further from the, the terminal unit, uh, it being the panel of the sail. But, um, sorry, the capacity is, uh, is uh, directly or um, related to that uh, proximity. Um, heating's the same. And uh, we'll talk about the control on the water side here in a minute. Um, we t there's different designations for this space, and this is a this is an acknowledgement that panels near the perimeter exhibit more capacity. Uh, it's not a well studied uh, field just yet, and uh, currently we're researching this to be able to provide additional guidance for consultants, so that uh, information such as the uh, the internal glass surface temperature can be used to uh, enter these tables more confidently to uh, purchase just the uh, optimized panel area required uh, given the quality of glass that's installed in the space. And so that will be uh, ongoing and, and that will be published uh, as that research is, evolves. But uh, this is uh, effectively the rule of thumb that is used currently uh, and it doesn't assume any glass. It basically is just an outside wall uh, to uh, show that panels near uh, a surface that has a, a large differential because of the high or low temperature outside can yield uh, an increase in radiant capacity in the immediate vicinity. So think in the uh, in the first 10 to 15 feet at the most from the glazing, those panels will yield more capacity than the panels that are in the core of the building, uh, the interior the interior field, and that can be 10 to 15 percent easily. Um, here, there's a little bit of a discussion about glycol. Glycol in cooling systems are death. Uh, they destroy the cooling capacity and they uh, require a, um, far more pumping energy. So be very careful and mindful about uh, using glycol in uh, radiant chilled ceilings. Uh, not to mention if you have a leak, it's uh, more difficult to clean up. Uh, there is motivation to consider glycol, particularly for uh, the water side free cooling application, but uh, best practice is to decouple that from the building. Uh, to manage the costs on uh, on the glycol, as well as just to keep that distributed loop from uh, having to be charged with uh, um, uh, that fluid, and the pressure drop can be managed then with a plate and frame exchanger or uh, or what have you. <clears throat> um, so this is a, just a quick panel capacity calculation where we're calculating the room dew point. We're setting them in water temperature. I would say three and a half degrees uh, Fahrenheit above the room dew point. Uh, we're calculating the mean water temperature based on our delta T, whether we use five or six degrees as a temperature rise, um, enter the tables for that capacity, and then uh, size the uh, selected area. If the, uh, if the area is inadequate to meet the load between the primary air that's needed for ventilation and latent control uh, and with the ceiling, more, it's not uncommon to see more primary air used. And uh, that might be just for peak loading, and so there can be a discussion about uh, how do we manage the air side as best as possible? Or we might find that it's uh, just not manageable and a better solution uh, could be uh, fit into that particular space. Uh, this is a summary of just those uh, steps um, on uh, comparing each of them. I'm gonna skip through this pretty quickly in the interest of time. I see that we're close to the end and I wanna make it through uh, the last few slides. <clears throat> Uh, this is an array, and, and this design service uh, it, to uh, assist with consultants is available through uh, Buckley and Trois, whereby uh, we'll, um, with the reflected ceiling plan, if that's provided to us in AutoCAD, we'll lay out some of these circuits to show how the uh, piping might drop into the space for control. And each of these shaded zones are representative of a, approximately an equivalent water pressure drop uh, uh, distribution. Uh, the panels in between are uh, conventional acoustic ceiling tiles and the panels that are near the glazing are uh, 
two pipe changeovers. So we'll see those as heat cool. Uh, the panels in the field are cooking only. Uh, this is a rough map of what a radiant sail might look like in terms of coverage for the space. Um, we're extending the area out beyond the actual physical placement of the sail so that the air can drop down into the space and there's sufficient distance for uh, the convective air to rise to the ceiling and then fall back through, down through the sail. The sails are mounted proud to the surface of the ceiling. So generally we'll see uh, five to eight inches between the deck of the ceiling and the backside of the sail to give that gap for the panel to uh, recirculate the, the warm air through the backside of the sail and drop down into the space on its convective portion. <clears throat> All the panels are tested uh, and, and cataloged to about 12 feet. If there are installations over 12 feet, there is a table to follow that decays its uh, capacity in the space. Uh, but uh, if you're looking at uh, extended heights, please contact uh, your trois representative and we'll, uh, we'll help guide you through that. Uh, and uh, we're here to help with the uh, planning of mapping out the panels and providing some uh, some feedback on uh, experiences that we've seen to help optimize uh, capital cost and installations. Uh, here's some resources that are a great start uh, for those of you that uh, maybe uh, haven't waded as deeply into the uh, decoupled ventilation slash radiant, uh, low mass radiant cooling uh, world. Um, a great place to start to just get some general uh, knowledge and look at some of the details on how things are uh, managed and controlled. So that's the uh, that's the end of my uh, engineering presentation. Uh, the terminal units, again, if you want to talk about that, and uh, I'll look for some guidance here from Buckley as to whether or not we go through this quickly. Um, yeah. I, <clears throat> hey, Darren. It's Matt. Um, I think we should, in the interest of time, uh, answer questions and then tie, sure. tie off. Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. So did you did you receive the questions I sent to you? Do you have those? I do not have them in front of me. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, at twelve twelve, we had a question: How does the air distribution work in the in the theater application? Uh, I believe that was displacement ventilation. So those had, uh, if I understood it right, uh, swirl diffusers um, in the in the rows. And uh, so it was uh, displacement with the panels on the ceiling and uh, acoustic panels on the walls. So I believe that was displacement ventilation. Yeah, I would I would second that in a in the theater application um, or like a, an auditorium, a displacement ventilation system would be would work well. So um, next question uh, midway through was uh, what is meant by activated ceilings? Okay, uh, an activated ceiling is just a, a overarching term to uh, reference the radiant panels themselves. So in, if you were looking at a, a T-bar ceiling and you had a conventional acoustic ceiling tile loaded into say a two by two or a two by four grid, uh, if some of those panels were installed as a radiant ceiling, some of those panels might be a perforated aluminum sheet with copper tubes on the back that are piped with chilled water to extract heat from the space. And so those panels, excuse me, would be considered activated panels. Uh, other cases, there'll be metal panels everywhere throughout the ceiling, but they may not have the heat conducting rails and a copper pipe affixed to the back of them. And so uh, those would be just considered an inactive panel or an inactive ceiling tile. Uh, and it might be made out of aluminum to uh, uh, marry with the look of the activated panels so that there's a seamless look. You don't know which one's active and which one's inactive. But a, an activated panel is just an overarching term to represent a, an aluminum panel that has uh, been treated with heat conducting rails and copper tubes and piped to the distribution circuit to uh, allow it to act as either a heat sink or a heat emitter. Okay. So last question, and I think I might be able to answer this one, honestly, uh, is is uh, with the current pandemic issues, are you still recommending the radiant ceiling dash without any filter for room stratification? And I'll take a stab at this. So to be honest, um, Frederick, yes, the radiant ceiling I think personally will become more uh, applicable considering a lot of indoor air quality um, benefits can be found with a displacement system. So a displacement system will inherently need a decoupled heat source and that's where radiant heat panels can uh, come in play. Darren, do you have anything to share with that? No, I, uh, I would echo that and uh, can share with the group that uh, I am well aware that there is a tremendous amount of energy and resources currently being deployed in the U.S. Uh, for that exact topic uh, where they're researching uh, pathogenic transmission through 
100% outside air through uh, displacement ventilation, through uh, uh, stratified air streams. Uh, there is a, uh, a significant amount of resources that are currently being funded by the federal government researching that exact topic, uh, inclusive of our partners and uh, a host of uh, consultants that are uh, taking a stab at CFD modeling and, and other exercises to try to get to a, uh, a status to confirm their uh, their suspicions that uh, this could potentially be a, uh, a growing trend right. for, for pathogenic transmission and, uh, and infection control. Right. And for anybody wondering why it might be that way, is it, displacement ventilation is considered a single pass system. So air is brought in from the ground level and in the stratified zone, uh, it'll find the, the cool air will find a heat source, a person. They'll breathe in that air. And then when they breathe out, it'll raise, it'll rise to the ceiling where it'll be exhausted. So that air and those VOCs or whatever, you know, pathogens might be on that person are going to only, um, they're going to be exhausted from that airstream, uh, that air plume that's coming off of them in that stratified zone. So um, I think that there's going to be a lot more displacement systems uh, used in the future. And um, at Buckley, and me personally, I have a lot of experience with this type of system. And Price has been really pushing displacement for years prior to this. So I think that um, this is something that we can really help you guys out with under designs moving forward. So. Um, that concludes all the questions. So uh, I hope everybody has found uh, today's webinar useful and educational. Again, if you would like to check out our previous webinars, we have um, all of them on our YouTube channel, Buckley Associates. Um, and also, by the way, this it turns out that this uh, presentation is applicable to PDH credits. So if you'd like that, reach out to us in our follow-up email. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, and if you have any other questions about this type of system, please reach out to your local Buckley contact. If you don't know who that is, you can reach out to Sherry or myself and we can point you in the right direction. So Buckley supports the manufacturer's products from design phase through the sales process all the way to the final commissioning. And when specified, our factory certified uh, service team will provide equipment startup, which includes a detailed report um, and maintenance training for facility personnel. And they can even provide di diagnostic assistance uh, should any troubleshooting arise. So um, if you'd like any help with your uh, the design of your system or the specifications, please reach out to your, your, locally buckle, uh, your local Buckley contact or myself. And uh, thank you again for any, everybody involved in putting this webinar together um, and all of you still on the line that uh, spent your time with us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Yep, see you, Darren.